Mr. Buddy Guy, sir, how are you? Well, I'm doing all right for an old fellow. You know, uh, I, I could complain, but it don't help me. <laughs> right. Well, I do appreciate you joining us on the KDUX Morning Show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And meanwhile, I have to congratulate you right off the bat because you scored yourself your sixth Grammy Award. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, they were slowly coming, but I always was taught. I was talking to my oldest sister just before I got this. Your, your interview, my mother always did tell me, better late than never. <laughs> Absolutely. How does this feel? Because this is your latest work called Living Proof. Does that make it feel extra special? Uh, you know, all the, all the awards that I ever received in my life, I lay back and I thank God for the, the ones I'm getting. But, you know, I learn everything from the people who is being forgotten about. I didn't get any kind of award. I was up at the satellite radio uh, about a week ago, uh, a week ago, not quite a week ago, and I was telling them about people like uh, Smokey Hall, uh, Lightning Slim, which is the first electric guitar I ever seen. And every time I accept an award, I accept it in their honor, because they are the ones who should have got what I got, but the God works in mysterious ways. I got it, and... I didn't get a big head if the late John Lee Hooker say and say this is mine, not theirs. I think I, these awards are blown to everybody who I stole something from <laughs> when I was teaching myself how to play guitar. So that's my my biggest proudest moment is to say thank God I heard them so I could carry on. All right, on now in one of the songs on Living Proof, stay around a little longer. You said, I thank Lord for letting me stay around a little longer. It seems like it's a very introspective song. Would that be true? I would say so, but B.B. King had us all crying after we got him to help us do that. And on that last little ad lib that he was doing on the end, about uh, one, one day one day he pushing up days as I'm still his buddy. I said, oh, man, I don't even want to hear it, which I my mom. I was just talking to my sister because my mom's sister is being buried tomorrow. And my mother died on April 16, 1968. And I'm like saying, you know, I don't want to be reminded, but even though you don't want to be reminded of things like that, it's so true. And, and blues and spirit, you got so much uh, related stuff there that we just speak about the good or the, or the bad times. And uh, I, I just feel special when I hear something like that, and especially the way B.B. King did it. Yeah. You mentioned and you reminisce about so many good friends you've lost along the way, but yet there's still more songs to be sung. So you say you come along. Well, that's me. You go on to Hello? say, yeah, you go on to say we've come a long way, but we're a long ways from being done. I mean, that sounds like you. You're nowhere near uh, done with playing or writing music. No, I'm not. I don't know nothing else to do now. You know, there's a spiritual song. I may put it on my next CD. My mother never used to sing it. So I'm too far. I'm too far gone now to turn around. When you say that you, so many good friends you've lost along the way. What do you? Who do you think about when you think about those good friends, buddy? Well, that, that's BB's line you're telling me about. He sung that part about it. Right. Right. And. Uh, we we are speaking about uh, 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 you know the musicians that is not is not too many of us blues musicians left the traditional ones I should say, and uh, that's what he was talking about. He cause he didn't write the song. Now, mm-hmm. me and uh, uh, Tom Hammer, the producer, wrote the song, and we only wasn't only talking about musicians. We was talking about people who supported us. When didn't but two people know that we could play the two strings or three strings till we got better and better after we stuck with it so long because they are BB and uh, all those older guys who I learned from Sunhouse and Muddy Water and them, they was uh, uh, surviving with just playing and singing. And half of the time I learned from them, they was just singing the blues at night for a drink of wine and a good-looking woman. Wasn't on pay until B.B. came out squeezing the strings, and the British guys got a hold to the blues, and it exploded while you could make a decent living at it. Yeah. And in the beginning, they were just playing it for the love of music, not the love of money. Yeah. So you learned to play guitar on a diddly bow that you made. Is that true? Uh, I learned, you know, I, learned, I think I learned my uh, left hand know what the right hand doing by a rubber band and a screen wire I used to steal from my mom's window down in Louisiana. 
because we didn't have running water and electric lights like that. She'd have to get a piece of screen wine and tack it up to the window in order for us to get some air at night because, man, it gets so hot sometimes in Louisiana. And the mosquitoes uh, on them bios would would almost lift you and take you out to bed. And my mom <laughs> used to find that screen window stripped because the this, this, this strain would break so easy. And she said, these mosquitoes in here again. I said, I don't know what happened. I know I put that piece of screen on that one. And she go around, it was empty. And they finally found out that was me stealing it, trying to make guitar strength. <laughs> Great story. Now, buddy, when you talk about people that have supported you along the way, what inspired you in the beginning to pick up that guitar and play it? You know, I, I tried to get that from my my grandparent before they passed away, long before my mom and dad, and nobody knows. They couldn't go back nowhere in the family and find nobody was musical inclined. Like I say, before Little Walter, B.B. King, them come along, you know, the guitar and harmonic was obsolete, man. You couldn't even hear it in the, in the, in the, in the high school bands or the marching bands until Leo Fender and the technology made the guitar electrified and then Little Walter amplified the harmonica. Because otherwise, when I went to Chicago, I said, i got to learn something. And they would tell me, you used to could go to the little music store. We didn't have the big record stores like we got now. Like, well, was there some of them went out of business, Tower Records and uh, and uh, whatever the big guitar centers. There was always a little music store on the corner with one guitar. And you would go there and look in there, and Sonny Boy Williamson then would tell me, say, how much is that harmonica? And the owner would say, I don't know, just give me anything to get it out the way because it was taking up space. <laughs> <laughs> so when after they after they amplified and it went big, now you can't hardly afford to buy one. Yeah. Nice but enough. I was, uh, yeah, I was, uh, you know, I was just, I, I, I guess my, 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 as far as I went back with my four pound, they don't know nothing. And I just, I used to have rubber bands against my against my ear, and they would figure out what the hell was I listening to. But I heard that sound after you stretch it, and I would pick at it, and even the rubber band would make some kind of noise to you. What was that that feeling within you? Because there's a feeling and emotion that is groundbreaking in your playing. So, I mean, what is? Can you describe what that is when you play? No, because half of the time I tell my band right now, I, 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 I was on the stage in Denver night for last, and I say, look, you know, I might be the only band leader that you find don't have a set list down in front of me what I'm going to play, because if I do that, I'm trying to make Buddy Guy happy. I'm not trying to reach you. So when I walk out on the stage, I like to look in faces. Man, my favorite time to play is in the afternoon if it ain't a hundred and. 10 degrees, <laughs> and I can look in people's faces and tell if they really enjoy on themselves or not. If they not, I'll say, I need to change my style or pattern a little bit and see can I reach and make you smile, and I seize that. So I just, I I, I don't ever highly play for Buddy Guy, but in the beginning, as you, as I'm, if I'm answering you right, it was just like, Buddy, you know, if you learn how to play the guitar, it wasn't as I mean, I'm promoting a young man now uh, named Quinn Sullivan. He just turned 12, and, man, you got to hear him play. He's on uh, uh, Skin Deep. A cut on Skin Deep is called uh, Who's Gonna Fill Those Shoes. Now I got uh, I put a CD out on it myself. you got to get that and listen to it. And when you finish talking to uh, talk to Anna, and I'll make sure she gets you one. Now you're talking about Quinn, but, uh, uh, Quinn Sullivan. He's, uh, I guess, 11, just turned 12. Just turned 12, and it, he's so amazing. I, when you see him, you're going to think he got to be 40 or 50 years old to be able to play as much as he do. Oh, great. I look forward to hearing that. That would be fantastic. And you have inspired, I asked you the question about inspiration because you've inspired a lot of players over the years and some that have gone on to do quite well. I mean, we're talking about Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page. Stevie Ray Vaughan said, without Buddy Guy, there'd be no Stevie Ray Vaughan. I mean, how does that, how does that feel for you when you hear about how you've influenced people? Well, it it makes me feel somebody recognize something I did, but I still got to come out here and play. Right now, you're talking to me. I'm in the Jimi Hendrix territory. You know, he was from Seattle. I'm in Tacoma now. Mm -hmm. And uh, those guys, all, all of them said something nice about me, but I wasn't being recorded. I was being ignored, you know, except I was making records with Muddy Waters, Junior Wells, whoever asked me to come in and play the session, and that's why they was picking this out. I didn't have the slightest idea I was. 
<laughs> it's like I said something in the studio the other day, standing out like a so thumb. I got that from mama, my mama and them, but I ain't know I was standing out like no so thumb. But I was just playing what I got from the great guitar slim, the lightning Hopkins, the lightning slims, and the BB Kings. And the mothers and them, I was like, I don't know how to read music. I, I heard this, and I say, I can't play this like BB, but I'm I'm catching hell trying to find it. And by the, and me trying to find it, I guess I was creating something of my own. I didn't even know that until somebody told me. Yes, yeah, so, you know, you've been credited with bridging the gap between the blues and rock and roll. So what you were just feeling, I mean, that turned out to be something. Well, that's what they told me, but I didn't know that. You know, <laughs> I was just saying... I would love to join the crowd and be able to play. And I, when I went into Chicago, this would be 54 years ago, September the 25th, 1957, I was ignored then. But I came out, and I was always was shy until somebody taught me how to drink a glass of wine. I came out like Muhammad Ali. I used to have to tell the guitar players, I say, you, if you let me play, ain't nobody going to want to hear you no more. And I proved that <laughs> in the, locally in Chicago. But I never could get a record contract to uh Listen to him until Little Chest, the year, the year he died, he sent Willie Dixon to get me and says, Hey, man, you know, uh, that stuff we've been saying, they was telling me what I was playing, didn't nobody want to hear because I was a little loud and extortions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I went to England in 65, and that's when the British was coming out with it, and they was wailing, including Jimi Hendrix. And he heard that, and he come to, had never been to my house before, and this thing was... Uh, Willie just can go get this fucking buddy guy because the stuff he's been trying to sell us is hot and we were too dumb to listen. <laughs> right on. What can people expect? I mean, we're so excited to, to see you play next Wednesday at our beautiful DNR Theater in Aberdeen, Washington. But what can people expect from a buddy guy live show? Uh, uh, you know, uh, when I walk on the stage, if you or some, I know it's always someone there that probably don't know who the hell I am. I want you to walk away and say, you know, I didn't like nothing he played, but guess what? I could tell he was giving me everything he had. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah, I mean, we are truly looking. I can't hold this. back. I can't hold back when you, you know whatever I do. You know, I used to drive a tow truck. And when I got ready to quit, the boss said, don't quit till you teach me somebody to drive it like you because I don't have no problem with you. Well, we are looking forward to seeing you next Wednesday at the DNR Theater. Buddy Guy, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I, I can't tell you how excited we are for the show. So uh, I look forward to next Wednesday, and, and uh, we'll see you at our beautiful DNR Theater. Look, I can't wait to get there, man. And if you can, if I appreciate it, and whatever I can do, just keep in contact with Anna, and you can get me anytime. And I certainly will appreciate it. And uh, the, whatever blues you play is making me happy, whether it's mine or anybody else's, because the blues need all the help it can get. Thank you very much. We'll see you Wednesday. Come back and say hi to us. I will. I'm looking forward to it. All right. All right. Thanks, okay. buddy.